So, uh, any, do any of you have any questions before we start? I, I can oh. certainly take a moment. I, I was just wanting to um, clarify what the significance <coughs> of the uh, velocity squared average to the half power. Uh, uh, right, right. So, well, here, here, let me, yeah, let me just review. Uh, so, you're wondering what, what is Yeah, this? just the significance of what that seems for. Oh, All right. So, so I'll, I'll talk about that in the review. So, uh, again, just, you know, I always review a little bit. So, right, so then uh, Maxwell Boltzmann, Net velocity form, there's our Jacobian, uh, there's our normalizer, there's the business end, partials are partials, they're, they're, they're the spreads, that's the spread in our, prob that probability intensities have to be multiplied. Oh, too bad it's a partial, now I have an integral, but I'm going to give you integral identities. Okay, now we covered uh, most probable velocity, uh, likely on a test, remember you're just looking for where the derivative of this thing is zero. And that looks daunting when you first write it out, but reality is uh, you end up with two terms because you've got v squared here and the v there. It ends up being incredibly simple. We did it last time. It's also in that uh, little miniature text chapter I sent you. Average v, we've also done that. And uh, now recall that v squared is, um, I'll just write it out. Uh, remember, uh, remember that you can ask this, this stuff, anything you want, um, it's just why, right? Why would you do it? Uh, we have to get our, our limits right, and this happens to be 3 kT over m. Uh, if you look at the units, I'm, I'm also going to put a question, and I'll, I'll, again, I'm going to really spill my guts in the next hour, because next hour is actually kind of a fun lecture. Um, but I'm probably going to have you do some unit analysis, because you know I like unit analysis on the exam. It, those are the early questions. And what I want you to show is that, what, what do you think the units are? Could you guess? Oh, um, I mean, it's all average, you know, it's velocities, right? So it's what? It's meter squared per second. Meter squared per second squared, because it's average velocity squared. So notice that there's no square root. Uh, now, recall also last time, uh, that we were able to show uh, something neat with this, which was that I'm going to write this slightly differently than I did last time. I'm also a little bit doing this from memory right now, so hopefully I'm not going to screw this up. Uh, we were able to calculate uh, pressure. Uh, if I have a container, I know the volume, so let's just assume that because that's very mechanical. But you see, I can know the pressure. Um, th th the reason that v squared ends up being pretty important is because because this isn't squared, I can then plug in the perfect gas equation. Remember, we covered this last time. And, 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 because I'm doing it from memory, I made a slight mistake. I believe that's mass in kilograms per mole. Sorry about that. Uh, so anyway, remember, it's kind of cool that you can measure the, the pressure of a balloon. You know the volume of the balloon. You can measure the pressure. And then you can know the velocity of the individual molecules, which is not done with some million dollar spectrometer. I'm doing it with a pen, so that's kind of neat. And I think I forgot to mention this last time, so I actually feel pretty bad about this. Let me show you something else that's kind of cool. Um, now, remember, remember the first lecture last semester? What is PV? Uh, well, unit analysis. <laughs> remember, I told you PV equals NRT is the statement of the first law. What's the first law? Remember, do you? That's um, conservation of energy. So, what's PV? Energy. energy. Okay, now why is it not one half? And, uh, oh, and look at that. Uh, MV squared, right? PV, now we look at the videos. They're still freaking up. Anyway, pressure times volume has units of joules. Uh, MV squared, right? Makes sense? Why is it not one half MV squared? Hasn't that been shoved down your throat since high school? One half MV squared. This is one third MV squared. Why is that? It's like, I mean, it's one half kinetic energy, it's one half MV squared. That's the only type of energy we think about gas. So why is it not one half? Why is it one third? Is it referring to a three-dimensional geometry? Uh, well, actually, yeah. And I think I even mentioned that last semester. But let me let me put um, again. Let's let's uh, try to remember some things from last semester. Um, let's do this. One half mv squared, and let's make that equal to rt. Okay. Now, who remembers the equipartition theorem? A degree of freedom gives you how much energy? A half. Okay, how many degrees of freedom does argon have, being a little ball? Okay, a perfect gas, it's ball, it can't vibrate or rotate or anything like that. 
that gets one half RT per degree of freedom, how many degrees of freedom does something like argon have? Huh? Right? Three. Three dimensions. The equal partitions theorem says that a simple gas molecule, if you don't consider anything else, has three half RT degrees of freedom. Well, tell me, doesn't that, that go back? PV is, um, RT is PV, and then bring the three halves over. There you go, it's the same equation. So the reason that that three is there is actually equal partition theorem, one half MV squared. So this is what you remember. This is kinetic energy. What's just a little bit off is that the equal partition theorem says that a molecule doesn't have RT degrees of freedom, but three halves RT because of being in three dimensions. So anyway, significance. <laughs> Now, we often put this as RMS, and, uh, and I think I've already answered why. why. Why do I, you know, V squared is 3 kT over M. Why, why, am I, why am I taking that to the half when, when I graph it? And, and by the way, you've already given me the answer. You just don't, maybe don't quite realize so it. Right, right. It has to have the right units. I can't plot it on a graph of velocity because it doesn't have units of velocity. So yeah, I have to express it as RMS, root mean squared. Otherwise, you, you, you can't compare things that have different units, right? It would be like also gigantically higher than average velocity. Um, okay, any other questions? We're okay. Uh, so let me um, also then go over, um, oh, okay, relative, average relative velocity. So I'm gonna do this also slightly differently than last time because for one, I kind of thought about maybe this, what I'm doing right now is a bit better way to draw it and based on some of your questions. So we talk about A and B. And uh, so we want relative velocity. The whole point of this, and I'm just reviewing from last time, is if I'm writing a molecule and I start uh, using a stopwatch to time other gases and I can then back out their velocities, my observations are different. And I think that's because I, I really need to look, I'm, I'm fairly certain it's because I'm moving. All right, when I'm an outsider looking in, I'm not moving, but if I'm inside and I'm writing a gas molecule, then, then I'm moving, and that's why we get some slightly different results. But if we want to know things about the gas from the gas's perspective, then we need to do things this way. There's another reason which is why uh, we're going to do something called um, calculating mean free path. How far does a gas molecule move before it hits another one? And to do that, we have to think from its perspective. We have to write the gas molecule. Okay, now we talked about how if I'm going to talk, uh, if I'm going to do any analyses with two gas molecules, the, co the, the corresponding, uh, um, corresponding uh, probability density is the multiple of the two. And if you ever think like, well, okay, sure, but why? You know, it's, it's easy to kind of, sometimes the way we teach things that are very hard is to just repeat them over and over again and get you used to it if it's like completely counterintuitive. Uh, and so I, I try to avoid that, but sometimes, especially when we get into quantum, I'm, I'm not gonna have much of a choice. So sometimes we're just gonna do the same question over and over again. Uh, so just recall that the way to think, the reason this makes sense is you know you can integrate uh, probabilities and ask what's the probability that's moving up while well, that's also moving up and the answer is half times a half. So that's why that makes sense. Uh, now, of course, now if we're going to integrate them, then we've got their spreads, which are partials. Okay, so that's all fine and good. We can figure out the probability that one of them is moving up while the other is moving up. All right, but that's not the purpose. Our purpose was to look at relative velocity. And now here, let me, I am just going to graph that. Um, and I'm going to call this, it's, it's a new axis. And I tend to use a capital V for that just to distinguish it uh, for my own, <laughs> make sure I keep it straight. So what we're doing is we're looking at the same two-dimensional system, but we're rotating our coordinate system, essentially. So it's still the two, we still have two vectors. Two vectors live in a plane, that's why I'm drawing them in a plane. I guess they could be, they could be pointed at any angle they wanted to be, but I can, always, I can always put these into a plane, right? And now, what I'm doing is I'm just changing the vectors. I've changed one of the vectors um, by subtracting one from the other. 
Um, but now, again, my point about last time was once you do that, once you rotate one vector, you can't lose sight of the other. You've you got to maintain two vectors. And this is the center of mass vector. Now, relative velocity vector, I, you know, if that ever gets confusing, you just remind yourself a car moving at the same speed in front of you doesn't move. A car coming at you <laughs> at the same speed is not coming at the same speed. It's way faster, so that's easy. Um, what is uh, a little bit, well, I don't think it's too difficult to understand also uh, that center of mass. Uh, center of mass right would, would go right in between the two, obviously. If you say, say that they're the same mass and they're moving this way, the center of mass cuts right in between them. So hopefully that actually kind of makes sense. So there we go. Uh, now in your textbook, I also show that you can simply change the partials. I, I do a Jacobian, and maybe again, if you're a little bit like, wait, I forgot what Jacobian is, I will talk about it in the next hour. It's how we switch between the two, you can just switch between the two. Uh, then we simply integrate out, integrate out the um, uh, center of mass, that leaves a mess of constants uh, with the with the uh, relative velocity, and then what we want to do is integrate uh, the relative velocity. So we're going to have a little Jacobian. Oh, why don't we calculate the average relative velocity? Okay, and again, I show you how to do that. So we have, it's not really a normalizer. This is just a mess of constants that comes from the center of mass, Maxwell Boltzmann. Uh, geometry factor from Jacobian, we're wanting the average and that's the spread and it ends up being um, 8 kT uh, if we have two different masses the sum of the masses over pi times the mass is squared uh, so mass is squared, mass is multiplied, product of the masses uh, square root now remember, uh, the book, uh, the chapter I gave you does do all of the steps, and, and I don't remotely expect you to be able to do that, especially on an exam where you're nervous, uh, because it, that, that's absurd. You're, you're not going to be able to. Um, if you're a math purist, I just want you to see that. If you can just kind of follow along the flow, the rest are just details that are algebra. I'm pretty sure you can do algebra. Again, if you really want to see how it's done, it's in the book. It's all a mess of algebra, and I mean, I mean it is quite a mess. And what we get from this, oh, it, it would help if I remind you what this is. Okay, and from this, we get something that is kind of uh, I, I still just can't admit that I fully understand this, but the relative velocity is greater than the average velocity. Go figure. I just, I mean, again, I think it makes sense because if I'm inside the gas, I'm writing a molecule. All right, so, so I'm moving. And so then everything appears to be moving faster. Uh, okay, well, well, sure, all right. But, but at the same time, I'm moving forward just as often as I'm moving backwards. So that so it doesn't make sense to me at the same time. So I just I never could really quite get this untangled in my head. So maybe sometime I'll take some I'll start taking math classes. Maybe I'll take math classes in Chinese, and um, and, then, and then I'll understand this fully. So anyway, so that's kind of a summary of all of this stuff. Uh, and again, the next hour I'm gonna uh, cover um, some stuff about Jacobians and do some problems that are very, very directly, uh, very, very related to your homework, more so than I know I did last semester. Um, now I have, a, now the rest of this stuff we're going to cover is actually kind of fun. It's somewhat like math modeling. It's some kind of neat tricks you can do with this. Phenomenological models, remember that word, phenomenological models. So I want to show that. Uh, does anyone have any questions though before we move on? Um, these are actually kind of cool, so we might maybe have to go along and get a break. No one? Okay, so what we're going to do is there's three things we can do with this. Three things we can do. One of them is called a flux, the other is a collision frequency, and the last is a mean free path. And what's neat about them is it's just kind of clever how the math model is set up. It's not particularly hard to solve, and it's just kind of neat. Now remember, the whole point of this is, 
as you can see, I can almost always relate things to pressure. If, I, if you can give me the pressure, I can tell you a very large number of things about this molecule. And think about how, you know, the length scale of different than I am. You know, here's a balloon, here am I, and I am composed of unbelievably large number of molecules. I cannot see a molecule. Uh, maybe if I have a million dollar spectrometer, I can. Yet I can tell you all about it. And I can do that with the pressure gauge. I'm, remember what balloons were like in 1800? Leather, I had balloons, right? So we can do that. Okay, so this is called a flux. Um, so back in the day of physical chemistry, fluxes were, everyone studied fluxes. We're talking like 1980s and a couple of Nobel Prize, two Nobel Prizes, I've met both of them. Two Nobel Prizes got awarded because everyone just studied gas phase flux, uh, specifically when gas molecules would react with each other. And it turns out by studying the flux of the products of gas phase reactions, you could understand everything about the reaction. And we're not talking about that today, I'm just going to tell you what a flux is. So a flux is, I better maybe look at my own notes to make sure it's cool. Okay, so this is the number of collisions. Uh, yeah, it's pretty easy. It's because you read my chapter, that's... <laughs> or did you know that without my chapter? I'll train, okay. Uh, anyway, so, yeah, so number of collisions, number of collisions of gas, since we're, we're doing perfect gases still, uh, number of collisions, per time, so that's like a collision frequency. Now, there's another uh, little bit about this here. Let me, let me go ahead and draw <coughs> the geometry of what I'm setting up. Uh, I'm gonna do this in a box because it's just a little bit easier to follow along if I do it in a box. Um, so, a molecule is gonna hit the wall and bounce off. Now, there's an area associated with the side um, again, I don't actually really have to do this in a box, and actually I guess that's my point. When you calculate fluxes, you don't want to get married to the geometry of your gas chamber that you're doing 1980s spectroscopy to win your Nobel Prize. Uh, what you like to do is you like to make it transferable to other systems. Um, so, God, there was... Um, but what's an example? Um, it's like, like when you report gas imperfection. So remember, perfect gas law, but we all know that real gases are not perfect gases. So when you look at uh, things like steam tables, which again, I'm speaking in engineering, uh, information about real gas behavior, you can see things like compression factors, which are, you can take that number and apply it to your, mol the number of moles, your temperature, you know, your system. So we like to put things in ways um, that maybe look more complicated, you know, so what we have, this, this would have units of um, per second per meter cube, per, per meter squared, and that isn't, you know, I'm kind of looking at that, it makes me uncomfortable because I don't like that, just it sounds complicated. But reality is it's meant to be transferred, uh, you're meant to use this information to your system. Uh, anyway, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so, so, so what? All right. Now, again, I'm just using this geometry. Uh, I'm using a box for convenience because I can, uh, this is the phenomenological model. I know that uh, molecule, I know that this molecule is going to hit the wall. But now, how do I know that? Here, I know. I, I don't want to overly complicate this drawing, so I, hopefully I'm not doing that too badly. I'll just get rid of this. You know that this is the area. Okay. Okay, so this thing is in a slice. Uh, not my best job. Anyway, uh, this thing is in a slice of the chamber that's going to hit the wall in DT. Uh, so strike in dt time. I have to set up some kind of, you know, you know, if you want to say how many are striking the wall at one moment of time, the answer probably would be zero. Just like a molecule is moving at exactly 341 meters per second, that's the speed of sound. How many molecules are moving 341.0000000 meters per second at any given moment? The answer is zero. 
Uh, so I have to give myself some wiggle room, and I do that in time. And I see that this molecule, if I give it some time, it's close enough it's going to hit the wall. And that's because it is um, an average velocity delta t distance away from the wall. So if it's that close to the wall, it will traverse the right amount of space. It, it hits the wall at that point because there's, the wall is there. And there you go. I'll really make that look a little cleaner. Uh, times delta t. OK, but there's a stipulation. Um, for one, you have to be moving to the right. And that is actually directional. We'll call that x. So I, I actually made a mistake when I said average velocity. Uh, uh, net velocity, it actually has to be directional. So, so it, it has to be the average speed moving in only one direction. That direction heads to the wall. It can't be moving backward either. Uh, that means that it has to be moving positively. So, right. Now, now this does make sense. So I'm saying average velocity times a certain time, but I have stipulations. For one, it's moving in a direction and it's moving forward in that direction. So I have two stipulations on that. But now, it's defined, again, this all makes sense, and I will learn about that distance that this, this molecule has to travel, but it looks like I've got to do another Maxwell-Boltzmann, and now you're seeing why I, I was kind of blabbering a little bit at the beginning about how there's so many forms of the Maxwell-Boltzmann equation, and really a large number of things that can be done with it, uh, Manipulation, or, or well, here in this case, let's let's do. Um, I'm going to do this kind of slowly because I do this. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and do something that's similar to a homework. Let me, let me go ahead and do that. So I am trying to figure out net velocity in x, and only if you're moving. How do I do that? Okay. First step. Now I'm not going to say that this is equal. I'm going to I'm going to walk you through it. Uh, I know that. Um, you, can, you can almost just guess this. Let's just say that you're at the exam and I said, hey, write down the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution for Vx. And you're looking at me like, okay, okay, I do remember this. I remember this much. I'm certain that this is part of it. And you can imagine that you probably get almost full credit for this. And hopefully you remember, you remember this. Oh, okay. And I'm telling you, you are awfully close, but this isn't quite right. What, what are you missing? Okay, limits. Uh, okay, limits. All right, now what would be the limits? Let's let's just say let's let's um, consider all limits. So what would it'd be what? Times the uh, No, no, no. What are the limits? This is zero to the edge. Okay, not in this case. Remember that this thing can go forward and backward. Now, now, hold on one second. I'm just trying to, I, let's, just, let's just forget that we're going to do uh, positive velocities right now. I'm just trying to figure out, uh, again, it's like I said, integrate, let's say the question on the exam is integrate the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution for velocity in the x direction and show that it's equal to 1, right? So that's the question. And, and, and I'm a jerk, so I don't give you any equations, no cheat sheet, because some people roll like that, right? Now, again, you remember no matter what, you're probably going to always get the So even if I don't give you a cheat sheet, you're going to write e to the m v x squared over uh, 2kt. You're probably going to get that no matter what. OK. Now, the next thing is to remember that the limits would be minus infinity to infinity. And those are the units of meters per, uh, meters per second. Don't worry about that. And the question was to show that this is normalized. OK, so what do you think? Don't you need to if you integrate that, right? you need a thing in multiplied by it to make it one. We're, we're clearly missing the normalizer. Right? We're missing the normalizer. We'll tell you what, this SOB will give it to us. You know, will it give us one? Well, I'll tell you what, let's figure that out. Now, you look at the cheat sheet and you know, you know that when you see an identity that is the one you're looking for, that you're, you're probably doing, you're doing good. You're doing good if you see an identity that looks like what you think you need. Recall also on the exam, I'm only going to be testing your ability to set these up, basically. And what you see is, I better look it up because, um, because I'm just 
Um, I'm, 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 uh, actually, I'm going to have to do this pi over a. I think it's one half pi over a. Yeah, I think it's no. yeah one half pi over a. No. Now, what is it? I seem to be. I, I unfortunately I don't have. Um, I didn't write down the identity. What am I doing? I'm pretty sure it's half pi. Half is zero to So it's just square root of pi over a. Yeah. Yes, it's root pi over a. Uh, okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So do I get one? Let's see what I get. What do I get? Okay. I get pi um, the half. A A is m over two kt. Okay, there's the two. Uh, um, m to the half two kt. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so there you go. So I didn't get one, and therefore you didn't set up the question correctly. You didn't remember correctly. Why would you? And that's why I'm not so horrible to you as to make you try to remember all these equations because that would be ridiculous. Uh, of course, now you also remember to flip the north to, to flip that result over, and now you've got the correct Maxwell Boltzmann. And the question on the exam is to show it's normalized, and of course you're going to get it right because you know how it integrates when you just you just added that term. You, add, you added one over that term, so now you're going to get the number one. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, hold on, hold on. Now that we're going to do average in x, what, what do I do about this? All right, remember, remember partials, remember last Friday's lecture? So, so what am I going to do about this? How, how am I going to switch from three dimensions to one dimension? Oh, the uh, 4 pi v squared? I'm also sometimes prone to totally tricking you. <laughs> How do you switch from three dimensions to one dimensions, or you don't need to? You don't need to. We're in one dimension already, right? So remember, you can think of these as I, I know you can get completely lost in this whole uh, um, forming of geometry and all that. But I'm also telling you, when you have a single partial, you're one dimensional, and this is a one dimensional question. So no, you don't actually need to do anything. Okay, so this is properly normalized. Now that means that we're now ready to calculate the average velocity in the x direction. And so to do that, so there is no 4 pi dx squared. There is none. And uh, that, again, I don't know that I would have some snarky way of putting that on the test. I'm not likely to do that because I consider that a little bit of a feat of memorization, and I, and I don't care for that. Okay, so there we go, right? Okay, but now it has to be in the positive direction, so how do I do that? So you take up, you have zero. Right, it's very easy, very easy to set it up. Now remember, what I do have on the exam are Maxwell Boltzmann questions where you just simply set them up, and then you look at, I still have you evaluate it, but of course that just means you look at the cheat sheet. Uh, what does that mean here? I actually have to remember never to use the backboard because I'm going to use that, so I have to, have to remember that. And now you see a little bit more quiet. I like being in this room because I can just keep moving downward. And um, often when my back is turned and I'm writing and I'm erasing a time for a lot of slides. Anyway, so, so now you set it up. So, so you've done this on the exam. You've probably got 90%. Uh, a couple of points is to then use the uh, identity. So have I set it up right? Have I set it up right? Well, look for this. Do you see this? Do you see that? Yep, you do. So good sign that it's good sign that you're doing the right thing. Okay, so therefore uh, Vx plus average uh, put down the constants. 2 pi kb T. Uh, now remember that in the net velocity, that's to the three halves, and that's your three dimensions kicking, uh, showing up. Um, one half. Uh, a is all, <laughs> all these questions. A is um, m over two, two, two kdt. 
I'm just today is a K T. I'm writing K's today so the K B. I ignored you. I'm, I'm bad about that. So, uh, so what we end up with is uh, K T over two pi m. This looks like it's a, a bit smaller than all the other velocities we've ever calculated. Uh, I know that. Um, average velocity was 8 kT over pi m, so this is a lot less than that. And that kind of makes sense to me. Now actually, let, here, here's a good question. Let me just throw this at you. Now I usually put this on the test, so I'm going to blow that off. Uh, but what, do you, what would you think would be the average velocity in the x direction? Uh, let's, say that's, say, uh, let's say it's at minus infinity for the lower limit. What's the average velocity in the x direction? It'd be zero. Right, zero. Right, because half the time you're moving forward, half the time you're moving back. Here's another way of doing that. Odd, even, integrates to zero. So it's only because we go from zero to infinity that it's that that's not the case. Okay, so um, so that's see this is actually it. We're we're almost done, and uh, this is this is the only thing when it comes to a flux that there is to calculate the rest of the rest of it again is geometry. So going back to you see above, hopefully the camera sees that uh, you now know that there's this length. that you travel, which is um, the average, um, and do I actually, I'm just going to leave it like that, and honestly I'm just going to leave it like that. So you know what it is, but so what? Um, times, now if I multiply that by the area, what I get is a volume. Little dots. Sometimes I put crosses and things with the dots. Okay, that's a volume. This happens to be the, the what we call a collision volume. Anything in that volume is going to hit the wall. So now what I want is the number of molecules in that wall. And again, this is incredibly simple, but I, I know when I saw this for the first time, I actually really was like, what the heck do I do? Now you know the volume in the container that anything in that volume hits the wall in delta T time. To get the number of molecules that are going to do so, so remember, this is the volume. If a molecule is in this volume, it's hitting the wall. But how many molecules are in that volume? That's the number of collisions that are, that are going to occur in delta T. It turns out it's N over V. It's the density. Right, so the density, the number of molecules, if I have a mole in a liter, then the density is one, one mole per liter. And if it's a tenth of liter, that's this collision volume, then it's a tenth of a mole are going to hit the wall in delta T, and that means that the collisions, there's going to be a tenth of a mole of collisions. 6.02 times 10 to the 22 collisions will occur in um, delta T, let's call that a second. So there you go. Um, so this is the number of collisions, but a flux, of course, is the number of collisions per unit time, per unit area, and this ends up being really quite easy. Again, you have this defined, um, n over v, Except that, of course, what I would really like to do is uh, density is actually kind of abstract. What I would actually do is I'm going to put that in the pressure over KB. Um, it looks like I'm writing K as KB today, so it's just KT. So, um, in, in fact, in fact, if you're a little bit, little bit, little bit here, I'll leave that. If you folks don't quite recall that, I think I did that last time. I got PV is equal to N. RT, of course, number of moles is the number of molecules divided by Avogadro's number, except that I know that I can associate the, uh, I can divide R by NA, and so that ends up being NKT. Again, K is a, a, a Boltzmann's constant. And so now I see that um, P over KT uh, is N over V. So that's where I get that in case that's not clear. Um, and what do I want to do with that? Um, uh, not, not too much, really. Um, 
here, tell you what, tell you what, let me, uh, while I'm simplifying it, I'll do a little bit more and show you something that's kind of relevant, although, um, uh, let, let me tell you what, I'll, I'll solve that uh, because I also do so on the book. So this ends up being uh, P over KT, uh, and the average velocity was KT over 2 pi M, is that right? I actually forgot what it was. Hopefully I'm not screwing this up. Uh, P over 2 pi KTM. There we go. Now it's nice. Okay. So whatever. Um, what's neat about this is how many chemists are in here again? A couple. So you're in 344, right? When you do the flux, so I, I guess you engineers aren't going to be doing this, but there's this experiment you do in PCHEM lab where you take literally a hockey puck, so obviously I'm drawing this way bigger, and you pressurize it full of gas. Have you done a fusion? Have you done a fusion yet? This is the fusion experiment. What you do is you have gas molecules in the hockey puck and they're hitting the wall, but some of them come out. And so what you see is the pressure versus time. Uh, it drops because, of course, things are coming out of the pinhole. And there's an exponential decay. And from this, you get the area. You calculate the flux, and you get the area. So anyway, uh, often this class, if I'm doing 344, and I've done, I've done 344, actually, I've never taught 3, This is the first time I'm teaching 346. I've done 344. Uh, and every one of them is a chemist, they're all pre-med. So they're all in 344 and they're all doing this experiment. So you don't care. So let's move on. <laughs> anyway, okay, last bit. We're almost done. Um, so these are just, again, little tricks, geometry tricks with Maxwell Boltzmann. The main thing to get out of this, though, as much as it, it's fun to come up with these little models that are not hard to solve, but what I really want you to get out of it is notice my manipulation of the Maxwell Boltzmann. Um, you can think of all the creative ways I can come up with. And it's not so much, you know, okay, go me. It's that I'm going to come up with something like that for the exam. And so I don't want you trying to memorize any of these results with just how to use it. And there really isn't much to that. A little bit of dimensional analysis. A lot of remembering what an average is. The thing times the Boltzmann distribution. The other thing is, what are the correct limits, which of course that information is provided, and then can, are you smart enough to look at the cheat sheet, right? Because if not, that you should not be graduating. So anyway, uh, let's do another one. And this is it, called the collision frequency. Um, I always prefer to add Z, I'm reason this letter Z. Okay. The way this guy works is, this is how often gas molecules hit each other. So let's draw a gas molecule, and I'm going to make it round. We can approximate all molecules as round, because why wouldn't we? So it has a diameter, so D is diameter, you want to write that down. Okay, now here's the clever thing. What we define, we're going to do the same thing, the same thing. We're going to get the collision frequency. To do that, we're going to define a volume Multiply that by the density, and, and that's it. That's the end. And divide by delta t, sorry. Define a volume, multiply by density. Yeah, of course, there's a delta t in there somewhere. You divide it out because there's a frequency, and that's it. So this is really easy. So that's why I, I, I see I have just like five minutes, but, but I'm going to finish before now. OK. So define the collision volume like last time. All right, to do that, to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an area where, uh, so I, I've actually, yeah, created what I'll call a collision area. And be a little careful with this, uh, where you can screw this up, is it's, uh, the, the area of a circle is pi r squared, but the radius is the diameter. <laughs> okay, the only thing that can get you a little twisted is that the radius of this collision area is the diameter of the molecule, not the diameter of the circle. That's two radiuses of the molecule, which is its diameter. It is the radius of the circle. Anyway, anyway, all right, so I'm blah, 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 blah. Okay, now, let's create a volume 
by letting the molecule traverse some distance and of course it will do so in delta t of time, right? just like last time. Uh, so let's 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 write that down. Okay, of course there's delta t, and because we're worried about molecules hitting each other, we're going to have to use the average relative velocity. Now the reason that this works as a collision volume, although my oh god just bothered when things are not perfectly even, um, is because if you look at this, think about another molecule being in here. Think about another molecule being in here. You see? If there's another molecule in this volume, they have to hit each other because they're within, two di they're, they're within a diameter of each other. Two spheres that are within that have their centers within a diameter are touching by their radius. Right? It's just that's very simple geometry, right? So as this thing traverses, because they're within the centers are within two radii of each other at some moment. Now, now of course I'm I'm drawing this a little bit, you know, I, I, I'm trying to have you imagine this thing is moving over a certain amount of time. If in that time another molecule is in there, and in there I mean inside of the, the diameter of this outer, um, uh, this outer circle, in other words, within two radii, then they had to have touched each other, and I'll call that a collision. Right? It's, just, it's just simple putting little, you know, little marbles in a small bag, right? Um, if the bag is only fits two marbles, then they're touching each other. They're moving, so that's also a collision. It's the same word. Okay, so I know that looks a little bit um, kind of awful. It's the best I can do. Oh, well, you, you, got, you got my little write-up. So, and I did a little bit of a better, I did a lot better job in my write-up. But anyway, so if, if what I've drawn looks hideous, um, <laughs> just look at that. So anyway, that's why I wrote things up for you. That's why I wrote chapter 10, because I knew that my ability to draw things is not nearly as good as it needs to be. Okay, so anyway, area uh, it, um, times the length is going to equal the collision volume. And this ends up being really, really simple. Pi d squared, again, d is the diameter of the molecule. And I'm just going to put this, I'm going to leave it in terms of relative velocity, delta t. Now, if you want the number of collisions, you just multiply it by the number of molecules in the, in, in the volume, the density, and now the number of collisions. Okay, so another way of thinking about this is how many molecules are in such a small volume that they have to be hitting each other? They have to be hitting each other because this volume is defined as being so small that they can't both be in that volume unless they, unless again they're, they're radii or unless they're within two radii of each other. Okay, now the frequency, of course, is the number of collisions per unit time, which per unit time is already been defined, and there you go. Pi d squared, uh, the rel, which we've written out many times, and of course I'm just going to do the same trick of p over kbt. Not putting beats. Right. There we go. And, and that's literally it. Uh, simplified if you feel like whatever. It's just this neat thing. Now, for typical gases, typical gases, and what I did in your book, I plugged in numbers for O2 because that just seems like a, O2 at room temperature and pressure. Uh, what you get is around 5 times 10 to the 9 per second. Collisions doesn't have a unit, right? That doesn't make sense. So that is a typical collision frequency, which is a lot, right? I mean, that's, you know, a billion, five billion. I'm kind of surprised it's such a big number. And from this, here, I'll end here. I'm sorry, I did go five minutes over. Sorry about that. So we'll start five minutes after. Uh, we can define what's called a mean free path. Uh, generally referred to as lambda. I'm not, don't worry about that. I'm not going to be testing whether you remember z's versus lambdas. Uh, this is end up being really simple. 
It's average velocity over the collision frequency. And if you look at this, this says uh, units of meters per second, and collision frequency is per second. So this ends up being in meters. Right? So, uh, you know, if I threw this at you and said, what is this? And you're like, well, I don't remember what that is. I'm screwed. What you can do is a unit analysis. Meters per second per second is meters. Question? Is that average velocity or average relative velocity? That is average velocity. Okay. Average velocity. And um, I guess that's because I'm the outside observer making this measurement. So collision frequency, that's kind of obvious. I, I can't interpret that differently whether I'm on the inside or outside. But if I'm looking at this from the outside, then all my velocities are going to be average velocities. So uh, what this ends up being is um, average velocity. Now, one reason I leave z as relative velocity is because I end up dividing these two. And you may recall that um, that uh, relative velocity is uh, square root of 2 times the average velocity, d squared p. And again, remember that this is 1 over square root of 2. We just solved that a minute ago. So I'm just going to leave it at that. So what you end up with is kt over square root of 2 pi d squared times pressure. That's really, I, I'm just simplifying it. I, I don't really care. Anyway, again, it's kind of a neat thing you can do. And what you get is, uh, again, for like O2 at room temperature, you get this to be on the order of about 70 nanometers. What's kind of cool about that is, remember that O2, I, so I do this in the, in the book so you can look at that. O2's collision diameter is around 0.3 nanometers, 0.35. So this is, um, what, 1,400 times greater than that. So what I think is neat about this is, remember I always told you that perfect gases don't interact? So you always say perfect gases, they're, they're alone all the time. So all of our analyses are done with just kinetic energy, never really considering that gases interact. Well, why would they? They have to traverse, again, a molecule has to traverse thousands of times its own length before it runs into something else. So you can imagine it spends a very large amount of its time completely alone. So that's why the perfect gas works insanely well, except under weird conditions. Um, it's because of this fact right here, because things go a really freaking long time before they even see another molecule. That's why P equals NRT works. So I went over five minutes, so 10 minute break. Um, and we're going to do some neat things related to your homework. So I hope you come back. The, the next lecture is kind of fun. So we'll end it there. So the what, was, what was the length defined as for that cylinder? Uh, so just del so it's, it's very hand wavy. It's just this change in time, which I've never defined. Well, I call it a second. It doesn't matter. Times the time relative, relative time. velocity. Right. That's because they're, I'm looking at, I'm writing a molecule, and I'm trying to figure out how long it takes to, for another one to hit, and I'm moving. Another thing about this is, is what's, what's kind of cool is, Relative velocity is greater than average velocity. That means that if you're driving down the street uh, or in a, in a derby, say, the faster you go, the more you'll get hit. So you, you actually can determine that from these equations that we've covered. Uh, kind of neat, right? So anyway. Okay.